We've been in this series called Letters from Lockdown, in which we've been looking at the prison epistles. Um, and so we've been in the book of Philippians, so just a little bit of background, and then let's get into this particular, these particular verses. Um, the church at Philippi is believed to be the first European church plant by Paul. Uh, in fact, uh, Philippi is where the very first Gentile convert uh, in the world, ever, in a lady by the name of Lydia. Most commentators agree that Paul wrote Philippians um, while he was in prison in Rome between the years 61 to 63 AD, probably closer to the end of his life around 63 AD. And if we had to identify one verse in all of Philippians that kind of summarizes the purpose statement of the entire book, I think it can be found in chapter 1, verse 6, which says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. And so everything that Paul writes in this particular letter um, seems to be in an effort to uh, see and to participate in their progress of faith. In fact, Paul will later say that he considers that if he goes on living, because he's about to be martyred, but if he goes on living, it will be for their progress and uh, joy of faith. And, and so... Today, we come to a couple verses in Philippians in which Paul voices a great theological mystery. And it's the mystery of God's working and our working, and it dovetails into the subject of what has historically been called the Christian assurance of salvation, assurance of faith. So here's what Paul said again that Maureen just read for us. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your own your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act for his good purpose. And so Paul says um, two things in these verses that seem at the start in, incompatible. He says, first of all, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, which leads us to believe that our salvation depends on us. And then he says, uh, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose, which seems to imply that our salvation depends on God. And so I want to spend uh, our time today asking, how do you you know you're saved? How do you know that when you die, you will be taken to heaven to be with Jesus? Jesus. What assurance can we have that if we die today, we'll have an eternity in heaven? And how does this assurance impact our lives on a day-in and day-out basis? And so, four points today that I want want to talk about. I want to talk about three false assurances, and then the assurance. False assurance number one, the open road. False assurance number two, the legalist. False assurance number three, the libertine. And then our true assurance of faith. I want to talk about those four things today. So modern people today who either do not believe in God at all, or who do believe that there is a God, but they don't believe in a specific God, okay, they are generally not concerned with the assurance of salvation for a couple of reasons. Okay? First of all, uh, they often do not believe there is anything mankind needs to be saved from. So, and what? I mean, the, the, the phrase "assurance of salvation" is a mute phrase if mankind doesn't need saving. Um, and so, generally speaking, uh, people who either a don't believe in God or they do believe in God but not a specific one, um, they generally believe that that mankind is mostly good. And if there are any bad people who need saving, they are limited to murderers and terrorists and child molesters. But, but for the most part, everyone else will find themselves, after they die, in a favorable afterlife, even if that afterlife is just nothingness. Okay? And so, so one, reason, one reason modern people are not concerned with, with assurance of salvation today is because uh, they do not believe the majority of people need saving from anything. So they're assured of it. I don't need saving. I'm fine. Right? And so Stephen Turner said it well. He said, we believe that man is essentially good. It's only his behavior that lets him down. (laughs) So what's the first reason? The second reason why modern people 
uh, are, are not concerned with this uh, idea of assurance of salvation is because many, many people do believe that mankind needs saving from something. They just generally believe that the moderately good life will bring you to that saving line. So these people generally believe that most people meet the entrance standards into the afterlife, and most people meet those entrance standards with flying colors. The only people who are disqualified are people we don't like, like murderers and rapists and terrorists, or maybe my stepfather, because he was so cruel to me when I was a kid. Right? So I don't have a stepfather, by the way. Um, so modern man, interestingly, will often assume in this way the role of God in that they believe their moral judgments are the moral judgments wherein all humanity will enter into a favorable or unfavorable afterlife. In essence, their assurance of salvation comes from their confidence that they are good enough, and good enough means that they are not as bad as other people they have in mind. Okay? And usually, as long as we can identify someone who has done worse things than us, we can uh, feel confident that we will enter a favorable afterlife when we die. And it's, so anyone can play that game. Right, so, well, I may be a murderer, but at least I wasn't a mass murderer like Stalin. Right? I mean, how far will we go? Uh, or, well, I may feel superior to a lot of people, but at least I don't act on that superiority. Right? So, th so this is modern man's uh, assurance of salvation who do not believe in God or who do who do not believe in a specific God, their assurance is in the fact that they, uh, on their own, pass the entrance standards, whatever those standards may be. Okay. Now, something else to consider about the modern mind. Uh, modern people also find it very difficult. I'm not trying to be sarcastic. I'm trying to just state what is real. Um, modern people also find it very difficult to believe in an afterlife called hell. Like an afterlife called heaven is warm and fuzzy and easy to believe in, but hell either does not exist or, again, it only exists for the really bad people. Uh, and and uh, if what I and so if, if what I've just said kind of describes your present beliefs about the afterlife, I want you to know that that belief surfaces two things that are probably happening in your heart. Number one. It surfaces the fact that you definitely have far too high an estimation of yourself. And it surfaces, number two, the fact that you probably have far too low an estimation of others. And so the reason you have far too high an estimation of yourself is because you believe your judgments are the right ones. You believe uh, your judgment of yourself is the right one. You believe your judgment of others is the right one. You believe that anyone who uh, at least lives as well as you do will get in the afterlife, <laughs> okay? And you believe that the only that only the really bad people are barred from the good afterlife, uh, and, and unless you have some certified list from somewhere, the really bad people are the people that you judge to be really bad. It's your list, right? And so, but so let me but let me ask you, what will happen? If the drug dealer is on your list of really bad people and your child becomes a drug dealer, will your list change? Or what happens if the child molester is on your list of really bad people and your adult child molests someone? Will your list change? You see, you have far too high an estimation of yourself because you think you see and you understand far more than you actually do, and it's actually impossible for you to be unbiased in this way. But now, you may also have far too low an estimation of others. How so? Well, on the heels of your too high estimation of yourself is your belief that people who do really bad things are dispensable. Their value has been taken from them because they did bad things, and you don't have any place for them. I mean, I've actually heard people say, people, people do that, I have no time for them. They, they, could, they could rot and die, I don't care. Okay? So um, they're dispensable. And so the, the easiest thing to do if you do not believe in God or if you do not believe in a specific God uh, and, and you want to avoid being the judge of everyone, 
is to say to yourself, okay, well, then maybe there is no afterlife, good or bad, and we just cease to exist when we die, and I don't have to make those judgments. But the, the problem with that is you can't live with that. You can't live with that statement, right? First of all, if this life is all there is, uh, this life ultimately has no meaning. It's not leading anywhere. It's not about anything. It's eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And the only way you can live that way is just to not think. Exactly. Don't think. Which we probably try to do anyway, but you can't live that way forever. But the but, but second thing is this. If there is no afterlife, that means this. It means that all of the horrific things that have ever happened in the world, slavery, child molestation, um, murders, Wars, suicide bombers, etc., etc., etc. All of those things, if there is no afterlife, will never be judged. Everyone gets away with it. Dennis Prager wrote an insightful article in the Jewish Journal in 2012 in which he, he, um, he spoke to this. He titled it, Is There a Heaven and Hell? And he said, if God loves, he must judge people. How can a loving God not judge people? If God didn't judge people, it would mean that he did not care about justice. And how can a loving God not care about justice? If God didn't judge people, it would mean that Hitler was not punished, while those uh, non-Jews executed by the Nazis for attempting to save Jews, they also were not rewarded. In other words, God's judgment of humanity is the best proof that God loves humanity. By definition, a loving God judges. In fact, there is ultimately no difference between atheism and believing in a God who does not judge. Such a God would be as irrelevant as no God at all. So if you believe the afterlife is an open road policy where it's compulsory heaven at all, uh, uh, for all, except the really bad people, you just need to know there's some fundamental flaws in that belief that you cannot stand on. Okay. So false assurance number one is the, is the open road. Everyone's in, or at least the vast majority of people and are in, and I determine who's in and out, and, and, and so, there's, uh, and so it, there's no reason to be afraid of the afterlife. There's no reason for assurance of salvation, because we're all in anyway, at least those that I like. Okay? But now, but, okay, so now let's speak to the other two. What, what about those of us who are Christians? What of those who do believe in the God of the Bible? Where does our assurance of faith come from? How can we be assured that we're saved? What... What, what do we point to for that assurance? And so, um, for these false assurances in uh, 2 and 3, we, we have to jump into actually Philippians chapter 3. Uh, but false assurance number 1 is the open road. False assurance number 2 is the legalist. The legalist. All right, so when Marcy and I uh, graduated from college, it was an important deal for us because it meant that we successfully accumulated the required 148 credit hours with an overall GPA average of uh, 2.8 or higher. All right. So in fact, everyone who walked the stage on that day had to have met those minimum requirements or they didn't walk. Right. Um, now, some people did it in three and a half years. Others finished in more like seven years. Marcy was smarter than I, so she fin- fin- uh, finished in four. I fin- uh, finished in five. Um, but no one crossed that stage on May 14th, 2003, unless they had completed the requirements for graduation. Like, there, there was no grace. So, in other words, the educational provost never pulled a group of seniors aside at the beginning of the year and said, hey, I, you know, I know you've only completed 130 of the 148 hours, but I'm going to give you grace and let you graduate anyway and save yourself a few thousand dollars. Like, that never happened. If it had happened, and the rest of the student body found out about it, they'd bring it over, right? Um, So this is how education works. If you meet the requirements, you graduate. If you don't, you don't. Okay? And, And this is how the legalist of any religion, not just Christianity, of any religion, this is how... Uh, he or she views religion as well. For the legalist, the assurance of salvation is dependent on whether or not you have met the necessary requirements. So if you've completed the right rituals, if you've jumped through the right hoops, if you have, if you made a modestly regular attempt to be at the right religious functions, 
and spent your money respectfully well. Uh, if you've done all these things and more, you're in. If not, you're out. Okay. And what's interesting is that those in the first group, the open road group, tend to side with the legalist in this way. So, and, but the difference is this. Um, open road people do not have a list of things you must do before you die. Rather, they have a list of things you must not do before you die. <laughs> okay. So as long as you have not murdered anyone or raped anyone or bullet, as long as you have not, you know, uh, as long as you're not too much in debt in the IRS, you're in. Okay. Now here's where Christianity is so different. Christianity does, I want you to hear this. Christianity does have a good enough list that you must pass in order to get to heaven, the same as many other religions. The difference is that Christianity's list is infinitely longer and more difficult than everyone else's. And the Bible says there's not a person alive who can ever complete it. See, only the Bible uh, says the human predicament is so hopeless that God must act if they are to graduate, if they are to be saved, right? So the Bible says, you know, on your own, you don't get to the heavenly graduation. In fact, you don't have a chance. It doesn't matter what your GPA is or how many classes you've taken, you are graduating. And because this is true of every human person, Christianity says your entrance into heaven requires something called grace. Where grace is defined as the freely given, unmerited favor and love of God. Grace is like being given permission to graduate before meeting the necessary graduation requirements. But listen, grace is such a hard reality to wrap our minds around that Bible-believing Christians who know that humanity needs grace will generally go in one of two directions with it because it's hard to get a hold of. The first direction is legalism. So the legalists are the people Paul addressed in the first part of Philippians 3, and he said this, Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision, who serve God by his Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. So Paul said in these verses that the legalists are dangerous. He said they're dogs. Tell us how you really feel, Paul. <laughs> Dogs and evildoers and mutilators of the flesh, probably because they literally beat their bodies or starve their bodies to keep themselves from acting out their lusts and desires, because if you did those things, you weren't in. Okay? Paul says these people, quote, put confidence in the flesh rather than in Christ. So what does that mean? Putting confidence in the flesh is another way of saying putting confidence in our ability to complete the 148 credit hours, if we use that analogy. You see, the legalist believes in grace. He does. But he struggles with it. He believes he needs grace, but he believes that grace is 50% what he needs. Of the 148 credit hours necessary to get to heaven, the legalist believes he needs, he needs grace for 74 of those hours. The legalist believes that God gifts to you the first 74 credit hours, but the rest is up to you. They say, God has done his part, now it's up to me to do mine. And the legalist is not without scriptural warrant. Like, he's not cuckoo. Uh, he has a number of specific passages which point him in this direction. So here they are. Jesus said, if you love me, then keep my commandments. Matthew 5, 48, Jesus said, you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is. But there is that you know, impossible standard. Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Hebrews 12, 14, pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So folks, none of, the, none of these passages say, if you happen to be so obliged as a Christian, you might want to do some of these things. No, these are commands. These are like, do it. Okay? 
Uh, and so they, te they tell us the first part. They tell us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. That's what they say. And so some characteristics of the legalists, of any faith or religious is, are these. First, legalists tend to be very impatient with sin and those who struggle with it. A sin struggle for the legalist is in many cases evidence that you are not saved because saved people should not struggle with such things anymore. So they, they tend to be very impatient. Secondly, legalists tend to think in black and white. These people over here are clearly in. These people over here are clearly out. A person's salvation status can be easily discovered by simply asking them, have you done this, this, and that? If you have, you're in. If you haven't, you're out. Thirdly, legalists are seldom good at expressing any emotion but anger. They get very angry with those who can't get it together. They tend to view all forms of counseling as useless because what people really need is just to be told where they're wrong and urged to stop it. Okay? <laughs> yeah. And if they themselves are successful at stopping it, whatever it is, they, uh, legalists will often come off condescending toward others as if to say, well, if you just do what I did. Fourthly, legalists have little concern for those not like themselves. Legalistic churches are generally not known for their compassionate service to their community. They tend to think the reason most people don't go to church in our town is because their hearts are hard and they don't care. And we just need to stay away from the darkness until Christ returns and God will send those to us who truly want to change. <laughs> uh, and then fifthly, legalists tend to be spiritually shallow. They may have a deep understanding of the Bible, but they have a very shallow understanding of themselves. They tend to be cold and hard and, and hard to get to know. And what's interesting is that these five qualities can be found in deeply religious people as well as deeply irreligious people or even anti-religious people. There are some secular people today who are just as legalistic, shallow, and black and white as any religious person ever was. They have little, uh, very little patience for anyone who does not see the world the way they do, and anger is the only emotion they know how to express. So the legalist gains his assurance of salvation from the fact that he has obeyed and follows certain commandments and rituals. He believes in grace, but it's part of the story. He may still, uh, he, he just believes that he, he, he believes he received that grace once at the uh, salvation moment. And now the rest depends on him. And so these people were infiltrating the early church and demanding that new converts keep the law of Moses or they could not be Christians. They said, yes, Christ saved you, but now it's up to you to keep the law or Christ shall unsave you. And Paul called these people dogs. Why? Because their legalism led them to trust in themselves, not in Christ. And so let me say this before we move on to false assumption, false uh, assurance number three. Heresy in religion is not always a lie. Heresy in religion is not always a lie. Heresy in religion is part of the truth which is taught to be the complete truth. So the, legal, the legalist is right when he preaches, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Absolutely, brother. But he's wrong and he stops there. And so the legalist has part of the truth, but he's also a heretic. That's false assurance number one. False assurance number three. Number two, right? Number three is the libertine. Paul addressed the libertines at the end of chapter 3, and here's what he said to them. Uh, verse 17, Brethren, join in follow my, following my example, and note those who so walk as you, as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, as whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. So these people, Paul seems more sad about. And he calls them enemies of the cross of Christ, but he says, I say so weeping. These people were either a part of the Philippian church, 
Um, or people Paul knew might one day be a part of the Philippian church. Um, and interesting, these people probably understood a lot better than the legalists what grace was. And so they were likely Gentiles, not Jews. They were probably ec ecstatic to hear the good news of Christ. They heard about forgiveness and grace and pardon and no guilt and God loves and, and God no longer condemns because of Christ. Uh, this gospel would have been, was worlds different than anything the Greek and Roman world offered them. This God was personal, he knew them, and he invited them to know him. And it probably overjoyed them to know that God would one day, because of what Christ did, create a new heaven and a new earth in which all tears and pain and sorrow and insecurity would be eliminated. These people were grateful, but they were enemies of the cross of Christ because they acted contrary to what the cross accomplished. The cross nailed sin to the cross. But then these people kept sin in their lives. The cross crucified the flesh and the lust thereof, but these people gave free reign to the flesh and their lusts. Verse 19 says that their God is not Christ, but their belly. What does that mean? Well, that means that what directs their behavior in a day in, day out uh, situation is not Christ and what Christ did on the cross, but their perverted desires. Okay. These people would say, Jesus is my Savior, who needs a Lord? Right? Okay. So, but listen, um, well, before I get there, Matthew Henry in his commentary said this, he said, uh, they not only sinned, but boasted of it, and gloried in that of which they ought to have been ashamed. Sin is the sinner's shame, especially when it's glory in. They value themselves for what is their blemish and reproach. Christ came by his cross to crucify the world to us and us to the world, and those who mind earthly things act directly contrary to the cross of Christ and this great design of it. So the Libertines are they're activists for grace. If the legalists misunderstand the result of the cross, which is free pardon, the libertines misunderstand the purpose of the cross, which is to crucify our old man, that the old man be done away with. Okay. Paul would say to the Romans, for we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body uh, ruled by sin might be done away with, and that we should no longer be slaves to sin. But now listen, these people too have plenty of scriptural warrant for their belief. Romans 8.1, there's now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Right? Romans 8.31, who will bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies, I'm justified. Who then is there who, who condemns? No one. Matthew 16.18, Jesus said, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. I'm safe, man. Right? <laughs> Ephesians 2.4, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. And this is the one we all know well. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves as a gift of God. Not of your works lest anyone should boast. And so these scriptures lead us to believe that it's God who works in us and not we ourselves. And so some characteristics of the libertine of any faith or religious background, number, number one, they're, they're very accepting. They will almost never tell you you're wrong. <laughs> they're, they're, and they're encouraging. They tend to view humanity with rose-colored glasses, finding a way to think positively about people, even when those people hurt them. Secondly, uh, libertines tend to be enablers. Because they believe so much in grace, they, have, they give little, little thought to the inverse of grace, which is responsibility. They tend to allow their children to choose their direction in life based on how the wind blows them, and they feel that forcing their kids to go to church when they are young is pushing their religion on them. These parents are full of love and acceptance, 
But for guidance in life, they are of little help. They tend to be enablers. Thirdly, and this is important, love for libertine Christians has nothing to do with your lifestyle, but how you treat those directly in front of you. Let me say that again. Love for the libertine Christian has nothing to do with your lifestyle, but with how you treat those directly in front of you. So let me give you an example. A libertine Christian could, with clear conscience, make a living selling vodka to alcoholics, just as long as she did so while treating them kindly during the transaction. Does that make sense? To them. <laughs> Love for the libertine Christian has nothing to do with your lifestyle, but with how you treat those directly in Fourthly, libertine Christians tend to believe that if people would just be nicer to each other, the world would be cured of all her problems. Don't lock up the drug addict, just be nice to them. <laughs> uh, don't spank your children and calmly tell them how their behavior makes other people feel. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but there's an extreme here that we... Meanwhile, their, their own behavior enables other people to live enslaved to their sins, thereby perpetuating the world's problems and telling Christ that his cross was not all that necessary after all. They are enemies of the cross of Christ. So the libertine gains his assurance of salvation from the fact that God is gracious and forgiving and kind. They preach that it is God who works in you, both to will and to act for his good purpose, and they are right. But their heresy is not in what they preach, but in what they leave out. The legalist takes his own effort far too seriously. And the libertine does not take his own effort seriously enough. Therefore, both of them, plus the first, stand upon false assurances that will not save them from hell or damnation or get them to hell. So what then, let's go to number four, what then is the, the true assurance of faith for the Christian? Well, let me say this. What? What we are talking about today cannot be simplified in some easy formula, or let me pick three or four passages that give us our complete picture. And if you think it's simple, it's not. How Christ's work on the cross combines with our work in response to his cross is as mysterious as marriage. Marriage is what? Marriage is two people in a holy matrimony becoming one person. And so in God's eyes, a man, a man and a woman become one at the wedding ceremony. They launch into oneness from that starting point, right? But it is equally true, isn't it, that 20 years later they are still becoming one. Would you agree? Yes. They were pronounced one at the wedding, and yet they are becoming one with each other on each successive day, and that continued oneness requires work. They must work out their oneness, if you will. Okay? Well, salvation for the Christian is very similar. Christ and the sinner become one at the wedding ceremony, and the Christian wedding ceremony takes place not after accumulating 148 hours, which you can't do anyway, but the moment a person believes in Christ, confesses their sins, and gets baptized. That is where Christ and the sinner become one. Okay? But it's equally true, isn't it? That 20 years later, Christ and the sinner are still becoming one. Therefore, if somebody asks you, are you saved, you might be wise to ask what they mean. Do you mean that I participate in that wedding ceremony wherein God pronounced me one with Christ, such that his righteousness became my righteousness, his reward, my reward? If that's what you mean, then I say, yes, I'm saved. But, but do you mean, am I being saved? Because that's true right now as well. Not only was I saved many years ago, but I'm also being saved right now as I work out my own salvation with fear and trembling. But then do you mean, will I be saved when Christ returns? And so if this is what you mean, then again I say, yes, I will be, because it is God who works in me, both to will and to act according to his good purpose until the day Christ returns to take me home. So was I saved? Yes. Am I being saved? Yes. Will I be saved? Yes. 
And so with this analogy in mind, folks, let me say this. If I once was saved, then the best assurance I can have that I will one day be saved is that I am being saved right now. I'll say it again. If I once was saved, then the best assurance I can have that I will one day be saved is that I am being saved right now. God is working in me right now, both to will and to act according to his good pleasure. But now having said all of that, when judgment day comes, I will not have any credit hours in my briefcase with which to present to the divine provost. Christ alone offers those hours for me. And if this is still a mystery to you, good. Because it's still a mystery to me. What we are talking about here is more profound than any of us can wrap our minds around. And so we cannot give dogmatic black and white answers. But let me close with a quote from John Bright that I think uh, sums up well the balance between God's working for our salvation and our own. He says, both of these patterns of covenant, therefore, are essential to our faith. We can do without neither. To accept the grace of God while ignoring the commandments would be to sink into complacency, to become a church with no sense of grace, a travesty of a church, a church that is so much lukewarm water to be spat out of the mouth of God. Such a church can know nothing of the salvation to which it so complacently clings. But to shoulder the burden of Christ's commands without grace, that would be despair. Or a self-righteous legalism, an arid works righteousness that turning the, co the commandments of Christ into trivialities conceals from us our inability to keep them and live in covenant with them. And so, like Israel, we have ever to live in tension. It is the tension between grace and an obligation. The unconditional grace of Christ which is preferred to us, his unconditional promises in which we are invited to trust, and the obligation to obey him as the church's sovereign Lord. And so let me add that, that there's a mystery that we could talk for the rest of the year about. Let me ask you to prepare to surround communion. Are you living in this tension? of working out your own salvation, fear and trembling, trusting that actually it's God who works in you? Are you living in that beautiful marriage of oneness in which you were saved, you are being saved, and you can therefore have confidence that you will one day be saved because the previous two are true? Do you have this assurance of salvation? Do you think you will be saved in the end because you see yourself as better than most? No assurance in that. I mean, Hitler saw himself as better than most. Do you think that by accumulating 74 credits, you'll be saved? You don't know how bad of a student you are. <laughs> do, do you think God's grace assures you so much of salvation that you're free to do as you like? And I would argue you don't understand grace. On the eve of this Thanksgiving, let me ask you, do you see all that you have to be thankful for? Do you see how that you ran from God, but that God and his great love for you came running to you? Do you see how beautiful you are to Christ, that he would consider nothing more valuable than you? Christ did not come to die for green grass and flowers. He came to die for you, for us, for sinners like you and me. Do you see that though this world is hard, Christ came to save you for another world. Do you see that though your body is failing, Christ came to make possible for you a resurrected body that will never fail? Thank you. Thank you. Do you see that nothing you have ever desired compares, number one, to his desire for you, and number two, to what it would be like for you to truly desire him? God can work in you both to will and to act for his good pleasure, but you must surrender. You must give up. You must give in. You must give over all of your life to his will. His will for you. 
Have you participated in that beautiful wedding ceremony of Christ yet? If not, I would say you've not been saved. If not, I would say you are not being saved. And if not, I would say you will not be saved in the end. This is the message of the Bible. God came to save you, but he won't take prisoners into heaven. He only wants followers. Do you know how much Christ loves you? Do you know how far he came to find you? Do you know how much he wants to complete all of the required credits for you? Do you know how much you need him to do so for you? And then lastly, is this gospel, this good news, influencing everything you do in life? Does it change the way you work and the sort of work you produce? Or are you content selling vodka to alcoholics? Does it change how you view people who struggle? Does it change how you view yourself because you struggle? What do you need to do today? During communion, Al and I will be on both sides of the stage. If anybody needs to talk, pray, or if you feel like there's a specific next step for you, I'd like you to come see one of us during that time. If you would, please stand. Let's read our communion passage together.